Good afternoon, everybody, and we are back on World War II TV with another anniversary show. The events we're talking about today happened uh, this time of year, uh, 81 years ago. And joining me today, uh, World War II TV regular, but you know her anyway. She needs no introduction. History Hack, her own Holocaust podcast, Auschwitz podcast. The lovely Alina is joining me. Good afternoon, Alina. How are you doing? Oh, hang I'm on. I muted you. Hang on. There we are. <laughs> You muted me. That's fine. That's not a problem. I'm so grateful you've invited me to be able to do this on the like the eve because tomorrow is the actual anniversary of the arrival. But today is today is gonna we're gonna talk about what what today means and why and everything else. So, but thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very excited. Well, we we both are. I mean, it's it's a it's a tragic story, and it 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 only gets worse and worse for the people of Poland and the rest of Europe. But it's important to acknowledge it today. As you say, these events were happening uh, this day all those years ago. So we've got loads of images. We've got some audio files to play. We've got some video works uh, that Alina did a couple of weeks ago. Or we could go. Some of it's quite good. Some of it's a little bit jerky because someone wasn't quite used to using their stabilizing equipment. But anyway, it's the point of trying to get people an idea about what this story, uh, how it unfolded and the locations we're talking about. So without further ado, we're going to start, really. So Alina... Um, we did an Orador Sir Glenn show yesterday with Robert Pike. It was very well regarded. People really enjoy, enjoyed listening to it, although, of course, it was quite harrowing at times. And we made this reference that there are certain parts of France where even by 1943, 1944, no one had really seen the ter terrible side of the Third Reich and the Nazis. But Poland, of course, from the absolute get-go, wherever you are in Poland, you see the very, very worst of the Third Reich. So just... Before we get towards the first transport, remind us about Poland's immediate start to World War II. Well, this is the whole thing. We've, we've, however much I just want to talk about the first transport on Auschwitz, without being able to understand what's happening, we have to go back to the beginning. So, which is the invasion of Poland? I mean, literally, day one, early hours of the first September, and that's it. People are being bombed, um, there's an invasion, people are being murdered. There's 250,000 people that die during the September campaign. 250,000 people. That's an incredible amount of people to be killed during. How, do you know how many people died in the invasion of France? Do you know? Uh, was, I know 90,000 French military died in the like two or three months of fighting. So, I mean, that's the military. So, yeah, this is people. Also, yeah, that, that, yeah. So, yeah, Poland These are civilians. Is different scale, yeah. But we're not just talking about military, we're talking about civilian civilian populations. I mean, Warsaw was 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 partially destroyed as well. Um, so at this point, you've got Germany coming in from the west, and then literally 17 days later, you've got the Soviets coming in from my north, south, and east, and west going from the east. And I've purposefully put a map up for on the right hand side. By the way, I've sent Woody about a million different photos. And I've had to give myself a sort of uh, list here of which photos we're going through. So do bear with me on this one. So you've got the green side is by the Soviets. You have the purple side is by the Germans. And then in the middle, we've got something called the general government. And that is run by Hans Frank, uh, who we are, are going to come back to him uh, in a couple of slides time. But Poland is literally carved up. The red line is how Poland is taken in half. OK, and then you've got one and the other on the red side, purple side. God, I can't even tell my colours today. On the purple side, you have got everything that's incorporated into the Third Reich. Now, when we're going to be talking about Oshvenshim, I want you to all look at where Krakow is. Can you all see that? Right. OK, going slightly to the left onto the border and slightly just over the border is where Oshvenshim is. So Oshvenshim has been absorbed into the Third Reich. Right. So I want you all to be aware of where we are in our um, sort of maps, because I know you all like a bit of maps. So I have included- You all like good maps. Yeah, I've included a couple of maps here. So so Hans Frank, we're gonna come back to him, but literally invasion, terror, it is, it is just absolute chaos in Poland. So I think, hit us with the next photo, right. So we're gonna come across two photographs here. I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, the, the the terror in Poland and what actually happens, because it does happen from day one. You've got Einsatzgruppen. You had a great show on Einsatzgruppen, didn't you, uh, a couple of months yeah. back? Weeks yeah. Back. Um, well, Einsatzgruppen, as you all who have watched the show, Einsatzgruppen was operating since September 1939. I mean, it's not they're not operating from 1941, which is what most people assume. So Einsatzgruppen are in there. They're already rounding up Poles. 
They're already executing traitors, uh, people who are going to be uh, opposing the regime. And as you can see, this is Bidgosht. This happened in the first couple of weeks in uh, September. These men are already being lined up in Bidgosht. This is part of Bloody Sunday. And the next photo as well, we're going to come up with another one. So this is the same, same execution, two different photographs. And this specific photograph here um, is, it kind of explains the whole occupation for me. This man, and this photo is used in pretty much every Polish museum. And I think it's great because it shows you, the, this man is terrified. He's absolutely terrified. It shows you the brutality of what these people are going through. And the man next to him, he's pretty much accepted his fate at this point. So we've got executions are happening left, right, center. It is, it's unbelievable. There's people are terrified, absolutely terrified. And not only this, you've got hangings that are happening as well. This one is uh, of two Poles and a Jew in, um, in Wuch. And it's not just Poles, but also Jews are being targeted. But I need you to remember at this point, this is not when mass extermination of Jews is happening. This is not something that's been foretold this is not something that's going to be happening just yet i mean nobody knows that it's going to happen but it will be happening in about a year and a half to two years time you've also got roundups that are happening basically what the what the germans do they come to a road or a street they block off both ends and completely and utterly arrest everybody in the middle so i want to bring attention to this woody actually it's, it's, we're going to talk about france again now mirak who does the podcasting with me the asha's podcasting with me he gave me this absolute ideal scenario of what would happen so in france they would also have roundups however in poland everyone was arrested as they were in france and they were put into prison and most of them were sent to concentration camps, um, to work camps, executed, all sorts of things. But in France, when they were arrested, about the majority were released because occasionally they would catch themselves a Jew or somebody from the resistance. So that was the difference between the two countries of the terror. In Poland, nobody got out. In France, you at least had an opportunity to get out. You also ended up having a policing hour, which started at 7 p.m. Eventually, that got extended to 8 and then 9 o'clock. So if you weren't at home, like for example, my uh, grandmother, her friend, missed curfew because, wait for this, this is how stupid this becomes and ridiculous. Um, he was working just outside of Warsaw. And what had happened is the train was late. The Germans had allowed the train to be late. He walked home in the snow and they followed his footsteps. And because he was beyond the policing hour, they shot him on his front doorstep. This was just complete and utter brutality at this point. I mean, then we come into something even more interesting, which uh, will be Action AB or Action AB, which is the Palmyra, which will be on the next slide. Um, we'll see a, a, a part of this. I would actually recommend people to go to the museum in just north of Warsaw and Palmyra. They have got this amazing haunting footage of people literally being arrested, being taken and being shot in uh, the Campinas forest. It is, I still find that it, it's shaken me. So I've completely <laughs> missed there's another another execution. Um, and I'll come back to this one in just a moment. Um, I mean, do, do, just, just, I know, I know some people know this, but Lorelai is asking why, simple question, why the difference between France and Poland? Why, why are the Third Reich treating people differently in different countries? I, I, just explain it in your point of view. We're subhuman. We, I am a Pole. We're subhuman is the bottom line. We are just a little bit better than the Jewish population. We are used for labor. And I'm going to refer to we because, like I said, I am a Pole. We're supposed to be used for labor. And then when we're not useful anymore, get rid of us. That's it. That's the bottom line. We are not the types of Aryans that they're looking for. Blonde hair, blue eyed. I mean, we can go into this whole long other different sideline of Germans basically taking and kidnapping children, Polish children, that they basically raised as Germans. Um, but again i'm not going to go on to a complete other different i mean it's just it's just interesting to talk about we've talked about i've done shows about scandinavia how the germans treat people differently in norway and denmark how differently they treat france indeed what hitler said had he attacked in britain in operation sea line what if in their bizarre stupid evil the third reich have tears of how much they hate people and unfortunately for poland you are very near the top of the list Britain, further down the list, uh, Russia, very near the top of the list, Norway in the middle somewhere. And it's understanding that they have this, this different attitude to different peoples. And then within those countries, 
race comes into it as well. So your nationality is one thing, and then your race or religion is something else as well, or your or your sexuality or your mental capacity as well. So there's there's all of these different categories and criteria for just how much the third right hates you and how much they want to kill you. And if you're Polish, you're starting off at a very, very weak position. Oh, God, let me throw in something else there for you. Let's make this even more complicated. If you're a Silesian, you've got a better chance of survival. You know, and so this is another part of history that really fascinates me is, is Silesia, Pomerania, the kind of the former German the colonies, the former German lands, you know, where people's identity is kind of really interlinked. And I find that very fascinating because they were given an opportunity, they were given a chance, and it would have been like, right, okay, you're either going to be one of us or we're going to send you to a concentration camp or we're going to murder you and your whole family. You know, you've got a choice. And that's something part of research that I really want to go into a little bit more because, again, you had levels of being Silesian and it just becomes so complex and so interesting. And one day I actually found this very interesting um, uh, line by uh, Goebbels in one of his speeches where he talks about uh, the Polish Highlanders and he actually says that the Polish Highlanders, they're not really Poles, it's fine. You know, we can, they, they can, they'll be all right. You know, we're not, we're not gonna round them up and execute. So it is, it is not so straightforward to say Jew, Pole, Soviet, Russian, uh, it is so much more intertwined and complex than just that. And I think we we don't we don't talk about that nuance enough. I mean, we, nuance is a bit of a buzzword in World War II TV. I mean, in Normandy, and I always bring it back to them because it's where I live. People talk about the Austin Troop and the foreign volunteers for the Germans here. And they just say volunteers. They go, well, volunteer can be an absolute volunteer. There are Chechen soldiers in Normandy who absolutely have signed up to be part of the Third Reich because they want their independence from the state of the Soviet Union. Then at the other end of the volunteers, you have people who in the situation you just mentioned were, you can either join us or you'll be shot. And that's the type of volunteer you are. So volunteer is not a catch-all word. We use it as a catch-all word. But in this case, there's a lot more complexity to it. And, you know, I'm just going off on a bit of a tangent then as usual. But, um, yeah, it's important to make these distinctions that we often, we meaning us English speakers, I know you're, you're obviously you're, you're both, but, you know, Canadians, Brits, Americans, we kind of treat Europe maybe as a whole. Um, and, and yet where you are in Europe makes a huge difference about, as I said, how much the Third Reich hate you. I, do you know what? I'm so used to going on a tangent. But I'm going to rank. We're going to rang us back in onto this photograph, which is what I was talking about, Palmyra. So this actually starts in December '39, so literally a few months after the invasion of Poland. And this is in the Campinos Forest, north of of Warsaw, and you can see women already. So it's not the men that are being executed now. We've got women, um, and into that, let's add some children. Um, some some Jewish intellectuals. It didn't really matter if you were kind of influential. Then we're going to get rid of you. These people were all shot in the forest in various mass graves, and they've got a fantastic museum. I highly recommend people going up there. And this is part of Action AB, so Action AB, where they're going to liquidate and get rid of all the Polish intelligentsia. They've got no right to function. They are going to be the people that are going to oppose the regime the most. So we've got to get rid of them. They've got to go. And uh, it's actually really haunting the way they did this. What they did was they took them from Paviak Prison, which you can also visit as well. Highly recommend going to Paviak Prison. They've just had an overhaul of their um, of their um, exhibitions. And what happened, they basically loaded these people on. They gave them the personal effects. This is what I find the most horrific point. They gave them their personal effects, their keys, their papers, their food, Indian food. And they took them in trucks, blindfolded them, took them out, led them into the forest and just shot them. And I just, I just, for me, it's giving the personal belongings back is probably the most horrific point of what these people had to endure. But let's, I think we should move on to the Hans Frank quote because, um, oh no, no, wait, I'm looking at my notes wrong. Bear with me. Uh, what I did want to touch on before we do finish is Polish education. So when the Germans invaded, not only did they close down the schools, universities, libraries, any form of education, Hitler actually said on the 2nd of October, 2nd of October, at some point in the beginning of October, Hitler said, well, we've got to eradicate all Polish life. Everything's got to go. It's just, just get rid of it. They've got no right to have any of this. And what they did in, uh, in November, sorry, middle of October, they rounded up a load of uh, professors. So 184 of them were rounded up from uh, the Jagiellonia University in Krakow and, and in, 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 in local areas that were in the general government. And what they did was these these men basically wanted to start up university and teaching again. The Germans were like, nope, 
we're not having any of this, rounded them up, sent them to uh, the prison in Krakow. Then they went, this is a whole other different kettle of fish, but they went to various other different places. They ended up in Sachsenhausen. We won't talk about this in a minute, the idea of sending Poles into concentra other concentration camps in Germany. And then they all ended up in Dachau. And um, I can't remember the statistic, half, of the dozen, half a dozen, mostly the elderly ended up dying. It was, yeah, this is the point where people are just, forget it, no education, no nothing. We're getting rid of everything. But people were actually having an education at the time, but it was in secret. So in the secret, you know, uh, people's houses and things like that, they still tried to get an education at the end of the day. Wow. So let's hit that Hans. Here we go. Hans Frank. This is a quote. I use this for everything, as probably most Polish historians use this quote, because it, it just sums up the whole thing. So he says, I can tell you a graphic difference. In Prague, for example, big red posters were put up, which could be read that seven Czechs had been shot today. I said to myself, if I put up a poster for every seven Poles shot, the forests of Poland would not be sufficient to manufacture the paper for such posters. That should sum up Polish occupation for you. Yeah. It's it's a staggeringly simplistic quote, but sums up just everything behind what was going on there. Yeah, and he was the governor of the general government. This man, he lived in uh, Vavel Castle. He had a, such a lavish lifestyle. I think um, somebody did a, a podcast not long. I think with his son not long ago. I think. Wow. If I'm not mistaken. Um, a whole different kettle of fish. Whole different kettle of lifestyle. So. Which pretty much brings us now to Oshvinshim, really, and how Oshvinshim became Oshvinshim. So we've got photographs here. Actually, you can see in the bottom one, you can actually see the um, what's to be the crematorium in the background, very interestingly, um, and how the basically the, the, the camp group. Anyway, we're going to go back to how it started. So how does it start? So I did mention arrests, executions, and all sorts of things are happening in Poland at this point, and the prisons are now full. When I mean full, they are so full to capacity. You've got, for example, in a four-man cell, you've got like fifteen people. There's, there's, there's not, there's no room. So the, um, the I say prisoner guards. God, I'm thinking in Polish now. My language has gone out the window. Um, the uh, governors of the prisons are basically going back to to German government and saying, look, we we got to do something. You know, we can't send them to Germany because places like Dachau, Sachsenhausen, Mattenhausen, they do not have the capacity. They haven't built the infrastructure to be able to accommodate hundreds and thousands of prisoners. Sort it out, okay? Because we we just can't fit any more people into these prisons. So what they do in February 1940, they start to search for a new site. And uh, one of these sites considered is uh, the former Polish army barracks in Oświęcim, which is the ones what we're looking at now. Also Sosnowiec was considered and, and a couple of other sites. But the reason they chose this, and they chose this site here specifically in April 1940, so literally a couple of months later, was for two, two reasons. Uh, one was for money reasons, because as you can already see, there are barracks. You know, there's something standing. Things are standing. Things are functioning already. Uh, and number two is location. Uh, we are going to come to a photo in a moment where we'll be able to see the location is, is, is perfectly situated because it's isolated. And, you know, there's not going to be much trouble being caused at this point. So these mm -hmm. barracks are supposed to hold 30,000 prisoners. OK, we very well know this is not how it's going to end up because we're going to be looking at hundreds of thousands of prisoners eventually. But for the time being, 30,000 Polish political prisoners who are basically causing pro problems within Poland, and we've got to get rid of them. So here's to the map. Here's to the map. Here we go. Maps. You all love a bit of a map. So this is me screenshotting, obviously, uh, Google Maps. And we've got, as you can see, how it, uh, this is how everything looks now, by the way, which is not the way it looked like back then. Just, I need to underline that, you know, the stuff that we're looking at is not how it looked like in, in, in 1940. So we've got a little red cross. That's where the first transport arrives. Okay. And then to the right-hand side is uh, Auschwitz one, the main camp. Uh, further down, there, further there. down to the there, left. There, there, there we are. There we are. There we are. Yeah. There, there we go. go. I haven't got my glasses on the Lena. That's the problem. I'm, I'm following That's it myself right. blindly. You're forgiven. It's okay. And then obviously in the top right hand, uh, left hand corner, you've got Birkenau, which is the big empty space. 
So you can see also the size difference between the two camps. But the point is you're isolated by two rivers. Now, I mistakenly did not put in uh, the River Viswa, which I should have, but I didn't. But you can see right below the main camp, you can see the River Soa. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. You've got the River Soa. Yeah. I'm pointing at my screen. Not that anybody can see me pointing at my screen, but I'm still pointing at my screen. Um, and it was isolated between two rivers. So you've got money and location. The two most important things to why Auschwitz became what it did in the location that it did. So let's move on. Okay. Tardinov Prison. This is where it all begins. And why are these prisoners arrested? I think that's probably the one, one of the most important questions. Why are these men arrested and why are they being put into Tardinov Prison? Right. And, all, and also, I was going I was going to say that. And why Sorry. have they not been shot already? Because you've been talking about how many people have been shot. What's, why have some people been kept prisoner and not been shot? Is, is there any reason behind it or is it just sort of rather random? Right. So we've got various different types of prisoners in this prison and they're mostly young people, uh, former military. Um, and these men had, uh, during the invasion, decided that they're going to do predominantly one of two things. Either they're going to escape and they're going to cross the borders into Slovakia to reach the Polish Free Army or they're going to join the resistance movement, or both. They could do both. And those who ended up getting caught on the borders were called tourists. I still find that very ironic that they would call them tourists. But they would have been caught by Slovaks, um, predominantly if they were in Slovakia, and then brought back to Poland to put into prison. They were put into various different prisons, like, for example, Zakopane. And then they were moved into Tardinov prison once they'd established that this is where the first transport is going to be coming from. They were also interrogated in these prisons. They were absolutely horrific. Some prisoners um, state that they weren't they weren't interrogated when they got to Tarnov. Some of them had been in Tarnov since uh, 39. Some of them had been there for a few days. Some of them had been there for a few weeks and some for a few months. So it differed. And why were they not executed? Well, prisoners were being executed from Tarnov. I just... Do you know what? If I could ask Mirak, who's probably watching this and saying, Alina, why can't you answer this question more fluidly? He would probably be able to come on here and answer that question much better than I did at this point. So let's talk about Tarnov Prison. Here's with some. So what, what I've actually done is um, History Hack did a really amazing memorial to the first transport last year. And I've gone and um, stolen some of our uh, voice clips which i think you can't steal from yourself lena that's not a crime that's that's you can't it's impossible okay so self-stealing um i thought it would be worth you hearing their words rather than mine if that makes sense yeah and, th and these are a combination of actory people and just volunteers who offered us so we've got five we're going to play you now so this is a i think this is our only about the second time we've used audio files on world war ii tv so we had our broke our duck with using graphs a few weeks ago now it's audio files so this first one we'll, we'll, we'll play now That's number one. Oh, not finished. And that was George Khalil, who played Mo Ali in Band of Brothers. Folks, we recognize the voice. Second one. Prisoners were not allowed to take purchasable in groups. If any faces appeared, the guards would shoot at them. We were put into a communal cell, but the upside was that there were no more interrogations. There was little food and it was bad. I was always hungry. The prison was overcrowded, and the six man cells would have burned 20 people. We used the water in the toilet to wash. We could not wash any clothes, and we looked dirty. We came up by hunger. We would lie motionless on our bunks for hours, our eyes fixed on a single point on the ceiling, seemingly without a thought about us. 
Well, that was the audio files there. The last one was read by Peter Youngbud Hill Shifty in Band of Brothers. I don't know who the three middle voices were, but they they give you an idea of what some of these prisoners were experiencing at this time there. And um, it only gets worse, unfortunately, doesn't it, Lena? It does. I mean, some of the prisoners actually reminisced and said, especially the younger ones were saying, you know, um, if we could survive Tarnov, then we could for sure survive what's coming ahead of us. Um, considering nearly half of them don't survive. It's um, it's very interesting to see their point of view and how they survived in this prison. So then, today, 13th of June, 1940, is when they start to move off. So they were communicating with each other through pipes and things like that to say there's, there's movement in the prison, something's happening, we don't know. Uh, we might be going somewhere. Where are we going? Still, we have no idea. At this point, nobody knew what Auschwitz was. Nobody knew what this place is to become. And I use Doretsky a lot in, in quotations of things that I write. And um, that's that's pretty much what he says a lot of the time. We didn't know that this was going to be hell. We didn't know that this is going to be what it's going to be. So they they get moved to, uh, to the Jewish baths in the afternoon of uh, the 13th of June, 1940. I'm just, uh, but just their comments in there. They couldn't hear the audio files for some reason. They're playing fine on my thing here. I don't know why. Well, they they were very very faint. I don't know why that is. I'll don't, I'll 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 remember that for next time. But for some reason, everything's working right at my end. But anyway, um, can you can you have you got those written down? Those quotes you can read one of them, or can you just summarize what they said? Uh, I probably could do if you would bear with me sixty seconds to be able to have a look at my long. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know why they, imagine they weren't playing at all for some reason. I don't know why that is. Right. I've got Peter Youngblood Hills uh, here okay. off the top of my head. So, which was Kazimierz Albin, for those who, who know anything about the first transport. He's got a book out that I, I will show all the books later on. But he reads, weakened by the hunger, we would lie motionless on our bunks for hours our eyes fixed on a single point on the ceiling, seemingly without a thought in our heads. Uh, so that was Kazimierz Albin. And then we have, if you bear with me two moments, I don't know why I don't have all of this in one file. Um, and the other one was uh, Dretsky for sure. So Dretsky reads, life in prison here was full of discussions, news about the political situation and our own predicament, which seemed hopeless. Tarnov was a central point for collecting prisoners from all over Poland. Most were political prisoners or escapees. I discovered that anyone who had been in a position of a weapon was selected to be shot. My time in Tarnov gave me a chance to recover from the interrogations I had been through. I was still in pretty bad shape, having lost my front teeth. And Dretsky was actually arrested with his brother. They were um, crossing the border, as was Kazimierz Albin, actually. They were both arrested for, for trying to cross the border at various different points. Uh, the downside, downside the, 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 the horrible thing is that Dretsky is one of the prisoners that um, made me want to try and give up this subject. It's probably mm. the nicest way of putting it. Uh, I had to at one point, because you've got the English version, which I think is a little bit whitewashed. And then you've got uh, the Polish original transcripts in, in the archives. And um, he made me want to put them down and say, thank you. I need to walk away from this now. It's it's the way he writes about what what what's happened. So, so what we're looking at now, we're looking at the memorial. This is in Tarnow. Uh, I went to Tarnow and uh, tried, I'm going to say tried to do some videoing. Obviously, it didn't go so well this time around. So this memorial is across the road from the Jewish baths, which is what we're going to talk about now. So they ended up being taken by trucks to the Jewish baths, which I'm going to turn around in a moment. This obviously translates to say from this place, this is where the uh, 728 men were, were taken. So they were taken, by, like I said, mentioned before, taken by trucks to the Jewish baths. They were allowed to bathe and wash themselves. I say bathe lightly because some of these people hadn't bathed in six months. They had been sitting in their cells being able to bathe with that tiny amount of water, you know, from, from, from the sink or, or, or wherever they could access a bit of water. But that's about it. They 
can literally hadn't washed their underwear or anything. I can't myself imagine being able to be in that sort of state for, for weeks, for months. Some were nursing wounds. Some managed to bribe the guards to be able to get them a little bit of extra food. But the, overall, the prison conditions in Tadunov were, were just, just horrific. I mean, we're going to go into something that's even worse because at this point, these men in Tadunov in general aren't being beaten. So we've got the Jewish baths behind us. So this is where they went in, they bathed, and they slept there overnight. So that happened on the 13th of June. So today, today's 81st anniversary of this specifically happening. Yeah. That's okay. We can skip along. And just reference the cobbles there. Oh mind. yeah, so this is this is literally where they walked, and I um, I took a photograph on my Twitter page because I have quite a personal attachment to this story. So my great uncle, uh, my grandfather's brother-in-law, uh, Leon Lepensky, was actually in this transport number five five five, and for me, even though I've done it before, still being able to stand in in the last spot where he walked and walked in his footsteps where his family last saw him alive. And I'm going to come back to that story uh, when we start looking at some of the some of the footage further on. And it is it is quite moving at those points because as you all very well know, being able to follow the footsteps of family members is is quite an amazing thing. So they move out in the early morning. This is the route where they take. So if anybody's interested in going to Tarnoff, I'd highly recommend you do. It's a lovely uh, little city town. Um, and you'll be able, or just DM me on Twitter, or tweet me on Twitter, and I'll show you exactly where you need to go to be able to walk the route. So this is the route that I walked to be able to get to the train station. Um, however, Tarnoff train station is a little bit different. They actually were loaded a little bit further down rather than Tarnoff train station, but that's a whole other different kettle of fish. So, so this is me walking... Very badly. These True. are still these one. Yeah. So these guys, so these men, 700, well, actually it was um, 753 men that actually, and a few were removed by the train. But I'm going to stick with 728 because it's easier to follow the story that way. So 728 men are uh, basically end up being taken from the Jewish baths in the early hours of the morning. And um, the voice clip, I don't know if this one's going to work. Should we try it? I'll try, well, I'll just wait till the. I'll, I'll try it louder. See if it, if it can do something different. No. It's not working at all now. Turn off a fell silent. The Gestapo issued an order to civilians that, on pain of death. There was a total ban on leaving their homes or looking out of their windows. The streets were deserted and empty. There was a dull pounding of a marching column in a gloomy silence. Did you hear that, that folks? I had that very well. That went really well. I could. I had that really well. I'm. I'm assuming everybody else did. I hope so. I had to turn my lot. My, yeah, they heard that. I had to turn my speaker volume. I thought it would be playing it. It doesn't really matter, folks. I thought it would be playing it via stream, but it's actually my speakers that makes a difference. Okay, fine. I know that for next time. Perfect. Good. Right, so I want you all to be really aware of what he's just said. So the street's empty. Okay, pain of death. You literally cannot. So the streets of town from the early hours of the 14th of June are, I mean, obviously now that they're not empty, but they are completely empty. You are not to be in your windows. You are not to be looking you will be arrested or executed for doing so. However, I say this very lightly. People were looking through the windows. I'm going to come back to my personal story in a moment. People were looking through the windows. They would see, for example, a window opening and, and a hand waving. It's, one of the prisoners remembers that. He's like, is that a person saying goodbye to a family member? Are they saying goodbye to us? We got very confused to why, you know, this was happening. In another moment, there was a, an elderly lady who came out of her house and tried to feed the prisoners walking uh, in, 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 in rows of four, this huge long column. And um, the officer standing, the German standing next to her, who basically started beating her. And the prisoner remembers that everything, just her shopping and her food and everything just ended up spilling out on the ground. And this poor woman was crying. Obviously, he didn't get to see what had happened afterwards because he had to keep marching forward. People were trying to say goodbye. And I would highly recommend you listen to this podcast. I will retweet it tomorrow on my Twitter page um, or my Facebook, depending on who's listening on which platform. 
because there is a moment in this where it talks about our youngest prisoner who was 14 years old. Now, to this day, I still can't understand why a 14 year old is a threat. However, the youngest prisoner was 14 and his mother, he was from Tarnov, and his mother sees him and she follows the transport and she sees him on the platform and he's crying. He's crying and he's in his stomach. Mean, he's a 14 year old child who's seeing his mother surrounded by these adult men. He's been in prison and he doesn't know what's happening. And it's just absolute carnage. And it's been verified by uh, two prisoners that I found so far because constantly there are memoirs and things coming up all the time. So things tend to change, but it's been verified by two prisoners. Um, and a third prisoner also remembers uh, the mother from a little bit early on. So I'd highly recommend you listening to that point for that young man as they approached and walked. However, we are going to walk. I'm going to ask Woody to kind of uh, move us forward a little bit, um, a lot forward. Ah, here, moving us to here. The reason being is that I'm going to stop as I'm walking to this building. And this building is important. And I went, I went hunting for this building because I wasn't quite sure where it was. My family actually lived uh, on the first floor up there. And as I mentioned, my great uncle, Lonely Pensky, he ended up on the transport. Now, my family, one member still alive that remembers this. And that's my great uncle who lives in Krakow. And he remembers, even though he's a 90 year old man, and I've asked him this a couple of times, he remembers, and I, I apologize for using this kind of language. I, I do apologize, it's, it's not very professional, but he describes himself as a little shit, basically, um, a, 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 an ignorant little shit. He was nine years old. And their whole family was standing by the window and watching he noticed my great uncle walk past and he, he started going crazy. So what he did was he snuck out of the house and he followed the transport down the road to the train station. So it's not very far from the train station uh, to this apartment building, but nevertheless, he risked his life trying to follow the men, a young nine year old boy, because the Germans didn't care if you were, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, Children were being beaten in the streets. It doesn't matter who you were, where you were, and, and whatnot. So that's why he said that he was a little shit who didn't know any better. And he was the last person to see my great uncle alive. Because oh. my great uncle died in February 1942. So he's the last family member to see him alive. I'll move to the next clip. Yeah, go for it. So this, I want you to all see this church. Okay, this church is going to be very important in the next slide because this church was there in 1940. All right. Okay, so... I think we should just go for the second one, Woody. What do you think for the next clip? Right. So can you all remember that church and now see it in that background? Obviously, the photo is taken from higher up. Yeah, but this is the, yeah, this is the same photograph. This is exactly the same spot. Perfect. And we've got a couple of audio files. I'll try and get these to work better this time, folks. So let's have a go with the number one. I did not see anyone on the streets. During the march, a window opened on the second floor of one of the houses. And a hand waved at the prisoners. Maybe it was a relative waving goodbye. One of the guards shot at the window. George. So, oh, sorry. Anything, anything that was related to these prisoners, they didn't want them to see. I mean, of course, people are going to look, but nevertheless. So this is the photograph from here, the same one. So they end up in 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 Tarnov train station. Now we've got some more clips to go. Might as well use your clips. Might as well use my clips. Go for it. So this these is me walking. Building. Yeah, this is me walking to Tarnal train station. Obviously, ladies and gentlemen, this is not what Tarnal train station looked like back then. It's been completely remodelled. Yeah. 
few seconds to go. And there's a photo. Tunnel train station was bombed actually in 1939. Hmm. Just an interesting fact. And here, okay. and here they are uh, being loaded onto uh, third class passenger trains. And it's very interesting because they sat on these sort of wooden benches and uh, the Germans all kind of stood in each compartment. They weren't allowed to open the windows. Uh, so, however, some prisoners remembered this differently, as we all very well know. Not everybody has the same experience when you watch the same event. And some of them had uh, a, a better guards where they could share their food, they could have a smoke, they could, you know, have a bit of a laugh. Um, and they were just, they just didn't know where they were going. So they were trying to make the best of it. And just hit us with the, with the, um, with the quote as well. At the train station in Tarno, we were loaded into passenger carriages. We sat in specific sections guarded by the escort. We weren't allowed to open the windows. There you go. That was the one of the prisoners' experiences where they couldn't open windows. Um, Funny enough, one of the prisoners actually ends up escaping, coming towards Krakow, but that's a whole different other story. Uh, so this is the memorial, which is on the train platform. So if anybody ever goes to Tarnov, please go and have a look. So it basically says uh, that this is uh, that they were the first victims. Um, of of the concentration camp where the Germans murdered uh, nearly a million people from different backgrounds between the years of 1940 to 1943. Um, from Tarnov, there were taken 50 different transports. So, and every single prisoner who ended up on that transport, their names are put into, into this here. Alphabetically. Took me a while to work that one out. Mm. And as we did when you did the um the Warsaw Uprising show, whatever that was last August, July, when would you do that? Did we do that June, whatever it was. Um Poland is very good at memorializing these events. There's there's things everywhere around around Poland now, which is good. And are you at your age group, studying World War II, studying the Holocaust, are you an exception? Are you a rule? Are there lots of people studying it? What, where, where is it kind of going these days? There's loads of us. Um, just not many in English, which is the downside, mm. unfortunately. Um, we actually move on. The transport actually moves on. It ends up in Krakow. Uh, some of the prisoners say that it was about midday. They end up in, 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 in Krakow. Kozimierz Albin remembers that he had the Mariatsky uh, trumpet call welcoming us into Krakow and he didn't understand he, he was kind of a bit traumatized because he is from Krakow and his mother was literally a matter of streets away and she didn't even know where they were where him and his brother were at this point now these are photographs pre-war I struggled to try and find some from 1940 so it kind of gives you an idea of what Krakow train station looked like at the time now I want you all to imagine because I'm not very good at digitizing things. I want you all to imagine swastika flags everywhere. I want you to imagine uh, German soldiers walking around in their uniforms all over the platforms. I'm going to ask you a question, Woody. What happened on the 14th of June, 1940 in France? That's de Gaulle's famous um, message to the country, yeah. That's it. That was... Paris had been taken. So this news was delivered to this platform at the same time the transport arrived. Wow. So you had, through the speakers, you had patriotic German songs and you had people shooting their pistols into the air and shouting that we have taken Paris. Paris is ours. We will take over the whole world. The whole world will be ours. And mm. yet, the train was silent. All hope mm. had now gone. The Poles were hoping that the French would fight back and there would be something that had been able to... They, they, were, they were waiting for help. They were waiting to be rescued. And it's not going to happen. Not yet. So then, Eventually, but not yet. Uh, not, not in time for these people, yeah. God, another five years later... Um, we're not going to go into that. That's a whole mm. other kettle of fish. 
So what we end up doing is they cross the border and they come to Oshvenshim. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna state something very interesting. So Vladislav Keller, so those of you who have Anus Mundi the book, he writes, and it's something that I laugh at the beginning of his book, even though I shouldn't laugh at the beginning of his book. He doesn't talk about his arrest or anything. He talks about when he is on the train, what he experiences crossing the border, and then when they arrive to to, to Oshvenshim. Now, they change the signs at this point. It's now Auschwitz. They arrive at Auschwitz train station, and he's like, oh, where the hell are we? And then he literally writes, oh, somebody said that we're in some sort of shithole or other. And it's just that little bit of comedy just at the beginning of this book that's just going to take you through a whole roller coaster of emotions. Kind of is a bit... I don't want to say the word fun. That's not the right right word of saying it, but it's quite interesting. So I'd highly recommend you getting Anos Mundi. The Auschwitz Museum has a fabulous collection, which I will talk about later on. But anyway, so they finally get to uh, Auschwitz train station and they suddenly go off on a side track, which is this track. I didn't actually end up walking this whole track because I was in my motorcycle gear and it was really hot and I just it was just too hot for me to do it. So I am now walking along the tracks. And at that point, the prisoners also remember that it was they were old still. So they were old tracks from even then, even though they're still old now, they were really old back then. And slowly and kind of sluggishly, this train just goes and goes and it jerks a little bit. And they're kind of, you know, where the hell are we going? Are we are we going to, to, to a work camp? And, you know, we know we're in Poland. What What is happening? Where are we going? And you might as well hit us with some of these clips at this point. Yeah. Hang on. The sight of Krakow's ancient towers moved me deeply. It was barely half a year since my attack. My brother and I had left the city, and yet so much had happened in our lives since then. If only mother had known that only a few streets separated her from her sons. Out of curiosity and fear, we looked out of the window. There was an array of SS men on the platform. They were slapping each other on the back, smiling and happy. They were shooting their pistols into the air. The sight of Krakow's ancient towers moved me deeply. It was. Oh, we have a double. Since my attack, my brother and I had left the Maybe. city. And yet so much had happened in our lives since then. If only mother had known that only a few streets separated her from her sons. When we were directed toward, when the train stopped, the doors of the wagons were opened. And with the guards shouting, Laus, Laus, Schweinenhund, using guns, beating us. We were directed towards the front of a big building, surrounded by barbed wire and SS watchtowers. Beaten, pushed, and terrified by the SS men yelling at us, we rushed like a flock of panicking sheep through the open gate. I've got so to work that, on my audio skills, haven't I? Definitely. Uh, for it's next fine. Time. It's fine. Don't worry. It still gives us a sort of rounded idea here at this point because these train stops and literally they are being there's this there's a, a an absolutely amazing painting done by Władysław Siwek, which is in the Auschwitz Museum, and it shows coming off the, the train transport these men are being pulled off they're being beaten with the butts of guns they are literally it's a shock to the system to what they're about to go through they have no idea where they are why are they being beaten in the face they're being kicked they're falling down you know they the, everything that they own is being left behind and they're being rushed in towards this sort of uh, fenced off area with with makeshift barbed wire and these sort of guard towers, these these temporary guard towers that are standing. And we can already see in front of us, those are the buildings that they're coming into. They're coming into the former Monopoly building. So 728 young Polish men and a handful of Polish Jews are now going through this. What is going to happen? What are they going to go through? What are they going to see? What are they going to experience? And this quite nicely uh, brings us to my next point. Oh, so here we've got the, the former Monopoly building. This is post uh, the first transport, obviously. 
And I think you should be able to hit us with one more. Right, okay. I would like you to play the voice clip first. All right. Fingers crossed it works, yep. We also noticed a group of people dressed in well-cut blue and white striped uniforms and sailor caps. We were just wondering from where and when a bunch of sailors had turned up here. When at the command of one of the officers, they swiftly did an about turn and headed towards us. We now saw their suntan faces, their sadistically taunt lips, and the spiteful glint in their eyes, all of which bode no good. Apparently, the sailors were prisoners, too. Okay. Let's have a chat about these men. Um, yeah. A lot of people think that 728 men were the first transport into Auschwitz. I'm going to use, I'm going to correct the language here. They are the first mass transport into Auschwitz. So however many people want to, want to judge me for using that, it is correct. The first prisoners of Auschwitz who received numbers 1 to 30 were, and I'm going to, we're going to talk about some of these men here. They were the first kapos. They were the first functionary prisoners of Auschwitz. They were brought from Sachsenhausen in on the 20th of May 1940 so literally about a month beforehand they were going to be the new block elders they're going to be supervising the uh, work units and they're supposed to be the most sadistic of them all they were dressed as um, Peter Youngblood Hill says in the voice of Kajimish Albin here in literally like sailors and pretty much nearly every prisoner remembers this. They were like, why are there sailors here? They're holding batons and sticks. And who are these men? And then they turn on the prisoners. So I'm going to talk to you about prisoner number one, which is the top left-hand corner. The um, I'm going to say unacademically, the inc incredibly ugly looking one. Please don't judge me. He is Bruno Brogniewicz, prisoner number one. He ended up as the Laga Altesta, and he was the capo amongst capo. He was the senior capo of them all. In my opinion, our every historian ranges differently. In my opinion, he was the most sadistic one of the lot, because I'm going to come back to a story about him a little bit later. Uh, he got away with pretty much a lot of things. There was an escape at one point, um, which involved uh, two of the prisoners from the uh, first transport. And they left a, a note behind kind of accusing him of, of stealing things. He ended up in block 11. He got let out and basically carried on being a couple. These are 30 German men who are all criminals who have been brought from Sachsenhausen and they're there to terrorize the prisoners. We're going to talk about also uh, Leo Vyatorek, which is the bottom left hand. He is also an absolute sadist. So there's going to, I'm going to talk about the two of them, Brodnievich and Leo Vyatorek. And he had this high screeching voice that nobody could understand. He was the capo in charge of quarantine, which I'm going to talk about in just a moment, what quarantine was. And he was just sadistically brutal, forcing the men to do sport. And I say sport loosely. It's not actual sport. Um, he loved to kill people with exhaustion. And one of his favorite things to do was to shove his baton down the neck of a prisoner and make them choke. And Brodnievich used to, uh, what he used to do also, because um, they, were, they, were, they were two together, Brodnievich would also kick a prisoner till he's down and find some sort of stick, lay it across his neck, stand either side and seesaw till the neck broke. These are the types of men that we're dealing with. Um, prisoner number eight on left-hand side in the middle, kind of innocent-looking guy. Uh, no, this is uh, Anna Bom. If I've said that correctly, I'm very bad at pronouncing names. Prisoner number eight total sexual sadist and deviant. He was absolutely horrific. He ended up being the capo of um, the Theresienstadt section in the family camp in, in Birkenau in, in 1942, 43. He really hated Russians and he hated Jews with a passion, which he ended up being the capo of, of the Theresienstadt Jews, just is mind blowing. He used to have a young boy that would follow him around, uh, a young 13-year-old boy. We can uh, all imagine what he would do to him, unfortunately. We've got prisoner number 11, which is the middle on the right-hand side, Eric Gronke. Uh, he was he's a very interesting character, actually. He was the capo of uh, the leather factory, 
And he was uh, Commandant Huss's pet. Basically, he'd prom- provide him with uh, leather goods and things. And uh, Huss, because of his loyalty, uh, ended up getting him released in 1940. And then he became uh, kind of like the overseer, the boss of this uh, leather factory. He used to like drowning prisoners in the chemicals just for fun. He um, he ended up getting sentenced in the 1960s to three years and four months only for this sadist. He was also a rapist and a murderer prior to coming to Auschwitz. Uh, Conrad Lang, number 18, which is just at the bottom, um, he ended up in, uh, which is what we've spoken about before, is Derlewanger's brigade. Woody, what was Derlewanger's brigade? They were the shitheads who uh, went into the ghetto, uh, Warsaw, uh, later on in the in the in the war, and were very very nasty in the August of 1944. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry um, for using the word shitheads, but they, I mean, amongst the whole Reich of shitheads, they were particularly shitty shitheads. So this is where no. they recruited from. They recruited from concentration camps, uh, predominantly Germans, uh, who were sadists. And he was absolutely sadistic. I'm going to finish off with our top right-hand corner gentleman, uh, Johan. I can't pronounce his surname. I, I'm not even going to attempt it. And I know Milek's watching and he's going to yell at me for this afterwards. But he's number 26. Now, this guy for me is really interesting. He's actually disabled. He has uh, one hand. One hand, he hated Poles, loved to beat Poles uh, and brutalise them. He was a total sadist and he was a pervert as well. He fought in the Silesian uprisings uh, before the Second World War. And he used to boast how he would kill all of these Poles. I mean, he was a sadistic pole killer at this point. He gets his comeuppance, ladies and gentlemen. This is exactly what you've been waiting for. On the 28th of July, 1941, he is deported uh, amongst uh, 575 Poles, sick Poles, as part of the T4 programme. He's disabled, remember? He mm. kind of... He, kind of fits into that whole ideology of disability we need to get rid of the disabled he goes with Ernest Krankerman who I'm not gonna reveal how I refer to this gentleman but he was incredibly obese uh, and he arrived in September 1940 but he's a whole different kettle of fish so these two sadists end up on a transport and they end up in Sonnenstein and they get gassed I don't want to say good but yeah Hmm. no good Good. He gets his comeuppance. But however much I'm going to tell you the first 30 were absolute horrifically sadistic, most of them were. There were a few among them that were not. There is one that hasn't got a photograph, and that's Hans Bock. And I'm I'm going to start with Hans Bock because I find it very interesting. Woody, do you know or does anyone here watching knows who um, Father Maximilian Kolbe was? I kind of think I know the name, but I'm not going to jump in and make myself look an idiot. Okay. Hold that thought to Father Maximilian Kolbe, because he's going to come back to, to, to this in a moment. So Hans Bog uh, is the Lager Altesta camp uh, for the camp hospital. He is the boss of the camp hospital. He is a hard guy, but he is fair. He protects his staff. He does all sorts of things to make sure that they're all taken care of. He tries to help a lot of Poles in the camp hospital because, you know, most likely you end up in the camp hospital. You're going to end up either in the gas chamber or they're just they're going to shoot you, whatever. They're going to get rid of you. You're not useful anymore to work for them. So he did a lot to protect his people and to protect Poles. He became a friend of the Poles. He is the person who ends up murdering Father Maximilian Kolbe. Because Father Maximilian Kolbe ends up being starved. He is uh, the one who survives in in the cells of Block 11, and they give him a fennel injection to the heart. And it is Hans Bock who kills Father Maximilian Kolbe. We're not going to hold that against him because he did a lot of good. He ends up uh, being sent to, uh, gosh, if I, my, I'm thinking correctly, is uh, Bonaverka, so Monovica, to work in the camp hospital there. And he dies of a morphine overdose. He ends mm. up killing himself. Then we have number four, uh, Fritz Biggerson, uh, who was called Mother, the top left-hand corner. Uh, he punished prisoners in his own way who would pretend to be incredibly cruel, and he was the capo for the prisoner's kitchen. And he's released in 1941. Uh, Then we're going to hit number 24, uh, Kurt Pahala, 
his story is incredibly tragic. He um, aided, for those who know um, Kazimierz Piachowski's escape, please go and Google it now, because I'm not going to tell you all about it, because we could be here for another 45 minutes. Uh, but Kazimierz Piachowski's escape, please go and Google that. He actually aided these guys in the escape. That's him, isn't it? Uh, no, that's Vyachowski. No, it's all right. It's okay. Don't say. worry. It's okay. Yeah, um, all these names. I'm doing my best. It's all, it's all, all different, all different, uh, all different things. Um, he ends up getting arrested. He is flogged. He is uh, basically brutally and utterly just, just interrogated beyond. I don't even know how these people ended up surviving. And they send him to death. They put him in the starvation cells, and he dies after 15 days in January 1943. So he aided Poles in escaping. So they weren't all. It's, this subject is not black and white. But I want to go back to the, the, the those original the, the first photo you showed of the really bad sick yeah go for it go back there, because you said they were recruited from these um camps in germany so saxon house and whatever now there obviously there were lots and lots of prisons in these prisons how were these people selected were they selected did they volunteer i mean did they put a notice up saying wanted rapists murderers and sadists how, how, what what what's the connection did did they become that when they got to auschwitz or were they that way before or or both or what work has been done to understand how these people came to be that way? They're criminals. Most of them yeah, have been done sure. for things like already been done for rape or were career criminals in that sort of, or in that so sort of did, sense. So what I'm saying is, did the Germans kind of look through who their criminals were and say, this one's a nasty piece of work and select them? Or did they volunteer? And if they volunteered, what did they volunteer for? Did they think it was going to be better conditions? Was it power? Was it because... I? Oh, I mean, or are there too many different cases to give a kind of break it down and give a give a give a reason? So, Hurst, Hurst, um, the camp commandant in his diaries says that um, Gerhard Palisch selected them personally. We don't know how much truth is in that. Um, we can say that's a that's a possibility. He, he hand selected them apparently for their brutality. But I'm gonna when I do, I'm gonna finish off with Otto Kuzel who is a complete flip, but I'm going to finish answering your question first because some of these guys are not a brutal sadist at all. Mm. They're, they're assisting and aiding. Because there are a couple more. I just, we haven't got all the time in the world to yeah, sit yeah. through all 30 and talk about all 30s. I've just selected a couple of them. And um, they were told at the beginning, when the first transport arrived, the 728 men that had arrived are sadists, murderers, killers, rapists, they're poles, they're dirty poles, and they need to be dealt with. So this is where it all starts from. And Otto Kuzel is one of those where you, people remember in, in their memoirs that, you know, he, he was kind from the beginning. Doesn't matter, you know, who they were. But he started to befriend the poles more and more and more and more and more and more. And he actually ends up escaping with poles in one of my favorite escape attempts which hopefully you might have me back so we can talk about that one day because that is that is one of for me it's one of my favorite escapes and how amazing it was and how lucky they were sure let's do that we will do that but otto Kuzel, coming back to him so he's the one in the top right hand corner and i i'm gonna be i'm gonna be straight with you i'm obsessed with this guy i am absolutely utterly obsessed with this man because in this whole place of brutality and sadism this angel comes up this absolute angel so i'm going to give you an example there was a prisoner walking down the street i say street loosely and he was walking down the camp road with a torn shirt kuzel takes his shirt his shirt off his back and gives the prisoner his torn shirt this man was incredibly kind. He saved, I believe, my personal opinion. I don't want anybody to turn around and say, well, that's not how it was. But my personal opinion is he saved so many lives and he protected so many poles that it's just, it's mind blowing. He took part as a witness in all the, all the, um, the, the, the processes or the trials he was an absolute incredible human being, in my opinion. So I just wanted to show you the contrast between that mm. and this incredible human being. Mm. And I'll always talk about Otto Kuzel, no matter what. 
So anyway, moving back to the first transport. Um, so what they do, if you go back just one more, just go back to the other photo, I'm going to briefly go through the process of what happened. So they arrive into that middle square bit where the trees are standing. Yeah, in there, and you can see the train tracks down the side. The building closest to the bottom is the building, is the former Tobacco Monopoly building where they were housed. What they did, they got off the train. There was um, a, a speech done by Karl Fritsch where he says, you have not arrived to a sanatorium, but to a German concentration camp. The only way out is through the chimney. If you don't like it, get on the wires. If you are a Jew, you have the right to live for two weeks. If you are a priest, one month, and everyone else, three months. And this wow. was a speech that was repeated time and time again. They ended up going, uh, getting registered, and they were registered from camp number 31 to number 758. I'm trying to put statistics in my mind there. And the whole time they're going through this process, because they still have to be registered, bathed, um, given their clothing back and being driven back up to be taken upstairs into into um, into where they were they were going to be sleeping for the night, and these men were being it was all being done at a run. They were screamed at. They were beaten. Uh, Tadeusz Piechowski, There's a fabulous film coming out about him in Poland in the next couple of months. He had a cross around his neck. Um, Brodniewicz ripped it off of his chest and threw it on the ground. You know, these men are being totally and utterly brutalized. They spend their first night upstairs and they're taken into these sort of um, big rooms and there's hay laid out on the ground. This is what they're going to sleep on. Hay. That's it. You know, there is no bedding. There's no nothing. Hay. For them to use the bathroom, it gets worse. There is a bucket in the corner and that bucket quickly overfills. It is stuffy. It is hot. They it, it, they just cannot cope with these with 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 these conditions. They try to open the window. The window gets shot at. The German SS men would come in and rile them up and get them, you know, shooting. So they didn't even have a good night's sleep. This is the first night. This continues. This continues over and over and over again to the photo that you were showing just before, quarantine. And this is why I'm going to talk about quarantine. Two weeks, you're given quarantine before they were moved to the main camp. And there was only one other transport that was housed in the same sort of area, and that was the transport on the 20th of June, so literally a few days later. Now, I spoke about... Um, Bruno Brodniewicz and um, Leo Vitorek. These men would be forced to do... See, the, this is this is happening, and this is a photograph from France. This is not an Auschwitz photograph. It's just so I could show people what this looked like. When I say sport, I don't mean, oh, let's lift a bit of weights and, you know, have a bit of a run around. I'm saying you're being forced to squat. You're being forced to frog jump. You're being forced to crawl in the dust and the dirt with no water, with nothing. You are starving. It is hot. Okay. I just I cannot imagine being forced to do this. I mean, my personal trainer is bad enough. Now put me into that situation. It's, it's just, it's just horrific. So this is happening for two weeks. Their break time, they were taught how to sing German songs. They were taught camp behavior. And this is what happened over the first two weeks. Then they are moved into the main camp. So you want to chuck us to the next photograph would be great. So I have circled. So those of you who have been to Auschwitz, I've circled the building and I've also put an arrow to where the Arbitmacht Freigate is. And they were housed in blocks one, two and three. And that's where I've kind of done the, the bit of a circle there. Mm. And what I want you to imagine, what you see when you go to Auschwitz now is not what it looked like, like at all. So the whole section in the middle, and I'm still pointing on my screen that you can't see, the whole section in the middle where you say 6, 11, 15, all the way to the back was non-existent, all the way to the back. Yeah, all of that, that was non-existent. That was the, 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 the horse ground, the parade ground. 
And there were makeshift barbed wire being put around blocks one, two, and three, which I've circled. I mean, the camp was a, it was a mess. There was no plumbing. There were no toilets. There was no bathing facilities. Okay, there was no camp kitchen. There was a camp kitchen between blocks one and two. There was between two and three, there was a tank of water where you could sort of have a, I'd say, have a wash very loosely. Um, there were makeshift latrines, which were basically a hole in the ground. And only 10 to 15 prisoners could use it at a time. I mean, I'll explain this to you. 10 and 15 prisoners versus the first transport, a 728. And then every couple of days, you've got more transports, more people. Thousands of prisoners coming in where people could only use the latrines, the toilets. 10 to 15 people. Imagine the queues. And these people are suffering already from um, internal um sicknesses, diarrhea, you know, they're not having a proper diet, they're not eating correctly. So their days are starting out early, 4.30, 5.30, depending on the time of year, you know, and you've, you've got to get up at the gong and you've got to rush to try and get yourself washed, try and use the latrine. You could only use the latrine before roll call. Mm. I mean, I and of course, to... we're only talking about the very, very early, da early days. It's still yes. it's awful now, but everything is going to get worse and worse and worse as the numbers um, start increasing. And yeah, it's it's mm. it do it does get worse. I am going to say it, the, the 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 sanitary conditions in this camp do get better, and that is that is. A, I'm not saying they are magnificent and and it's lardy da because that's not what I'm saying. It, they get better to the point that there are there is flushing water. There is an ability to be able to wash. I say ability. I say that very loosely. Everything I say here is very loosely, mm. and it's a possibility. I mean, imagine being able. To, this is. I mean, this is what they would have for food, right? So in the morning they would have half a liter of this watered. I'm going to say in in you know loosely watered coffee in this sort of herbal style tea thing half a liter that's what you're having for breakfast for lunch you're having a liter of soup made up of the worst types of vegetables you know the fat content in it is it's just it's just nutritionally valued so low that they're at the point of starvation for dinner you're having 300 grams of black bread including um, a tablespoon of marmalade slash cheese and we're saying bad cheese 25 grams of, of sausage. I mean, how are you surviving? And the bread is supposed to last you till breakfast. Mm. I mean, please explain to me how anybody is going to be able to, they're, they're just about hovering over life and death at this point. And this is why organizing food was also a very important thing. Mm. Very important. I don't know. Do you want to carry on a little bit? It's up to you, Woody. Yeah, we've got a bit more to do, yeah. Let's do a little bit more. So I thought I would introduce those first few weeks. So we, we we looked at living conditions. You know, they were sleeping on straw mattresses. They were getting up early, working on the commandos and all sorts of things. You know, the sanitary conditions were horrific. Now, this gentleman on the left-hand side is Ted Olszewski. And every single prisoner statement or memoir or anything – will refer to this day. This day is the 6th of July, 1914. It is also known as the longest roll call in camp history. So I've got a quote here from Bolesław Beach, who ended up helping Tadeusz Wiejowski. So I'm going to read it out to you. When we got more friendly with the prisoners, I'm going to stop you there. The reason being, there were people who lived and worked in Oświęcim would come and work within the prison. It's not like I remind you, not the way it was back then. It was a very different atmosphere, very differently laid out. So we decided to help them escape from the camp. And it was quite possible at the time because the camp was not fenced yet and there were not enough guards. A prisoner, Tadeusz Wiejowski from Tarnowskie region, ag agreed to the plan. On Saturday, the 6th of July, 1940, he came to our room in block number 15 changed his prison clothes for the working uniform of Yusuf Patek, who worked with me, put on the band worn by our civilian workers, and about 10 o'clock, he went out together with us by the side entrance close to the crematorium towards the railway station in Oshinchim. We gave Yoski money and food, and he got on a cargo train going towards Spitkovitra. So that's basically his escape summed up. He literally walked out the front door, in layman's terms. 
Wow. However, the most interesting thing is not his escape, because he was the first escapee. The most interesting thing is, and the most horrific thing at the same time, are the consequences. So the consequences, two things happen. Uh, one that we're not going to get into, which also be a really fascinating talk to do. Um, the civilians began to be removed from the, the camp area. That were mass evacuations of civilians and expulsion. One. Two, what is happening on the right-hand side? It is a roll call and it lasts, are you ready for this, Woody? 20 hours. Well. Wow. Now, I want you all to imagine standing for 20 hours straight. Okay? I want you all to think that you would have to stand hands by your side. Then I want you to imagine having your hands above your head, then squatting, and then having to stand in the freezing cold night because in June in Poland, the nights are not yet warm in June. Then I want you to imagine to still continue standing through the hot day of the following day. I want you to imagine being beaten Okay, if you fainted, you were being beaten. There was no water, there was no food. Now, I'm going to be a little bit graphic here, and I don't mean to be so graphic in what I'm saying. When you sometimes have to go to the loo, okay, you have your toilet wherever you're going to. These men had nowhere to go. They were going where they were standing. And if they did, they were beaten. These 20, 20 hours were the most horrific. And just to add a little bit more to this, there was a transport that arrived that day that their first experience was not camp life. Their first experience was a 20 hour roll call. Mm. This is the brutality behind Auschwitz. This is what they were experiencing. Oh, and I just want to add one more interesting fact into this. And the, uh, the night of this roll call, the sixth and seventh was um, the first victim of Auschwitz. Ah. So when the first first person of Auschwitz died this night, um, David Vronkchevsky, uh, he arrived on the second transport. Uh, he was he was Jewish, and uh, he was from Bielskobiawa, which is where I live. So, round here, and he was the first victim uh, of Auschwitz, which is kind of a bit of a, um, a a circle if you think about it. So the first victim of Auschwitz was Jewish, and he was the kind of and this is something Midek said before. He's the pretext to what was to come. Well, I was just thinking of saying that. I was just thinking that, that you know, we haven't even got anywhere near the Von C conference of, of 1942 and the absolute ranking up and, in, uh, and of the whole extermination policy. This is, this is just, uh, this is a uh, pre all that. This is, but it, the, the writing is on the wall that everything that was going to happen has already been shown to, you know, the bar, the Barbary, of the arrival of the Germans in Poland in 1939, the arrests, the imprisonments, the shooting in the forest, the hangings, the, the, the imprisonment and the convoy. And that's why I think, you know, the first transport, it does get talked about a lot, I suppose, but it's because it starts everything in motion. It was the, it, it began everything. Nothing, nothing got better after then. Everything got worse and worse and worse for the country. And indeed for the, for most of that part of Europe. Yeah. And they're yeah. important. They're important. The first transport is incredibly important. And um, I know some people don't think it is because everybody deserves a voice, but everybody does deserve a voice. But these men do. These first men. I mean, I should really talk really briefly before we finish about statistics, because sure, those sure. are important. Um, we should know this. So our youngest prisoner, as I mentioned before, 14. 14 years old. I still, this is mind blowing. 14 year old kid, our youngest prisoner. The eldest was uh, in his 60s. And um, so how many survived? 728 men, uh, 325 survive. So I calculated that about 45%, give or take. There might be a mathematician, mathematician here who will correct me. Is that right, yeah. Uh, 292 for a fact, killed. But we still have no information on 111 of them. We don't know. We just don't know what happened. Hmm. And survival no. for these, this is the highest surviving transport in, Aus in Auschwitz. Most of them survived. And why? Why did they survive? Well, the, the answer is quite simplistic. They were the first. 
they knew how the camp operated. And they managed. And, and a lot of prisoners talk about luck. And luck is something that I really, 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 oh, don't forget to give book recommendations. Yes, I saw that. I will not forget to give book recommendations. Um, I've totally lost what I was saying because I saw I saw the quotation in the corner. Because uh, I get excited about books all the time. I'm a terrible, um, well, terrible we all, person. We all get excited by books. No, yeah. Um, and um, uh, just to let you do know, before I, before I do forget, because I might forget this, my new book will be out in 20. 20 where are we 2020 or 2022 my new book in early 2022 it will be out it will be on auschwitz and it's going to be really interesting i don't want to give away too much more information about it but it will be on auschwitz and it's going to be giving you some unknown histories which is re i'm really looking forward to working on this a bit more mm. um and how they survived yes luck luck is very important um I, i'm going to give before we do finish i'm going to give you a really quick example of luck um Zbigniew Drecki, for example. Actually, no. Let me give you a better example. Uh, Czesław Sowol. Czesław Sowol, because I've got too many of these memoirs sticking in my head. He was playing football with the German Kappa, which did happen on a Sunday. They would play football. See, this camp life gets a bit more complicated here. They were playing football, and he encouraged his friend to score a goal against the Germans. Luck kicked in. Luck didn't kick in. Let me just say that. Luck didn't kick in. And his friend was chosen to be executed at the wall the following day. So if he didn't score that goal, would it have changed things? Mm. Yeah. And there are so many of these stories. I was lucky because he didn't look at me. I was lucky because, you know... I was moved from the hospital at the right time. I was lucky because various different things happened. So I'm going to give you some of these book recommendations, unless you've got some questions for me. No, I'll go with the book recommendations. That's good. All right. Okay. Some of these are really hard to get hold of now. Do perceive. So I'm going to go with this one. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. So this way is Kajish, Kamish, 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 oh my God, can we talk? Kamish, Kajimish Albin. Start again. And uh, Warrant of Arrest. Fantastic book. I highly recommend this one. I use it quite a lot. He's also, um, Peter Youngblood Hills speaks a lot about him for the History Hack podcast. Fantastic. Really well written. Highly recommend this one. Because he also talks about his arrest. He also talks about his experiences in Krakow during the Second World War and what happened. That's really interesting. Uh, this one is also very difficult to get hold of. Um, but it is worth it, which is, the, I keep talking about him, Big Nefteretsky. I use him a lot. Um, his history is really interesting. <clears throat> and the most horrific thing probably about this story is when he loses his brother. That's the point where I basically walked away and said, thank you very much, I've had enough. And then the Auschwitz Museum, I highly recommend people buying books from the Auschwitz Museum because they've got a fantastic collection of memoirs. This comes from um, a series because Kellard's book is really, really hard. It's to do with publication rights and things, really difficult to get hold of. But I highly recommend Anus Mundi by Vyaswav Kellard. This is part of a series and uh, my, my friend actually created this series and you get people like um, Helena Birenbaum in the series and Langbein and all sorts. It's a big series, about 400 zloty, which is I think is about uh, 60 or 70 quid, <clears throat> very worthwhile buying. It's a big sort of series and you get this book. So it is a plus. And then before I forget, there is one story and I I, I, I should really mention the story because it's one of my um, most favorite stories. It's to do with Edek Galinsky and uh, Mala and their escape and their love. This is a fantastic comic book done about this. Um, they've done a couple of different series at the Auschwitz Museum. You can get this from theirs. It talks about what they did. I mean, the photographs are absolutely horrific. I've read through this and 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 I'm horrified. But this is one of my favourite stories. It ends in tragedy, just so you all know. But um, it gives you some sort of hope mm. when reading it. So... Those are the ones that I can give you for the first transport. And if anybody wants any other book recommendations on any other points of Auschwitz, then I can do that. Yeah, I'll just mention in the comments there that to follow you on Twitter and indeed follow the Auschwitz Memorial because they do a lot of good work spreading um, information about it. And um, 
Well, I think we've we've covered everything really. Um, as sombre as it's been, it's important to look at these history, and it, and and it is yeah, eighty one years ago, and it, it just got worse. And um, I think with the Holocaust, it, it's such an all encompassing subject. You've either got to look at it from the big point of view and go down, or start at the bottom end and go up. It's tackling it in the middle. It's such a big subject. You have to kind of start. I mean, obviously, most people read Anne Frank's diary at, at, at school somehow, but, you know, that's only one aspect. And, of course, it's a Jewish perspective, which is important. But I think we all need to be reminded that many, many different peoples fell victim to the Third Reich regime, not just Jews. The Jewish part of the story is huge and important and well-known and well-documented and needs to be talked about, but also just regular people not that the jewish aren't regular people but, you know other people who fall into other categories need to be talked about as well and the all-encompassing nature of the holocaust i think is is important to be talked about um just to let you know the jews on this transport and the earlier transport none of them survive yeah, yeah none of, of them course. survive at all yeah yeah, it's just, it's 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 interesting. I mean, we've I, we literally started streaming this show fifteen minutes after England's game in the Euros, and it's it's weird because the world is talking about football and what have you. Again, all countries coming together, and just within living memory of people that you know, these events were happening. So that's what we, we we need to be minded, though we're not in a perfect world now. We're actually in game. You know, Croatia played England. Austria are playing someone. Finland played Denmark last night. It's it's fascinating that we have come so far away from this, and yet we only have to go down a little bit back, walk in, and see these monuments and see these events happen just a few just a few decades ago. And say so your your family was caught up in this, and that personal connection always makes it rewarding when we speak to you, Alina. So, thank you. I I really I want to say I've enjoyed being on the show very loosely. Um, enjoyed I. I I enjoy talking about the subject. It's, it's, it's it is, to enjoy sharing it with other people. It's not the, it's not enjoying the stories. It's enjoying the fact that other people are hearing them and understanding it and taking a point to uh to to consider. Oh, yeah, it's uh, France are playing Germany, of course. That's the other big game tonight. But um, I'm just going to remind people what we've got coming up, and I'll come back and say goodbye to you in a moment, Alina. So, so we've got another show later, and an hour and a half's time. In fact, I'm with Gert van den Bogart talking about combat in the hedgerows of Normandy. Uh, with the American second division. That will be an interesting kind of show, so we'll do that. And then tomorrow, another Battlefield live stream, Colin Taylor, uh, who does the driving and the filming and the guiding. He's doing a presentation about the Battle of Longev, British 50th Division, Durham Light Infantry, 4th, 7th Hussar, uh, Dragoons, in the village of Longev. That's kind of near Tinny sur -Sel. But right now, as usual, don't forget to check us out on Patreon. Check out Twitter, check out, check out Facebook. Follow Alina on Twitter. Follow History Hack. Listen to what she's doing with her uh, uh auschwitz podcasts they're fantastic uh i think i put a link in the in the description below to alina's podcast if i didn't i'll put it after the show i think it's there um other than that it remains me now to say thank you very much alina, alina for joining us and um you'll be back to talk about something else well well we've got i don't want to announce it too early but we are going to be doing a holocaust week in september i'm not going to say something to look forward to but something to prepare yourselves mentally viewers in that we're tackling stories like this for the entire week and i will be interested how the views go of that whether people will embrace it and listen to it, whether it will tail off as the week goes on because it's too much horror in one week it'll be an interesting ex experiment to see where the world war ii tv viewership is in september and what they can but i think it's important to, to spend a bit of time doing some complex complexity of, of looking at, at the horrors and the death camps and, and that. So I'm not exactly sure what shows we're going to be doing yet, but Alina will be on at least one of them. So we'll see. I'm hoping to rope in Mirek. Mirek, if you are listening, you will be joining me on that one because you want that man on. He is a fountain of knowledge. We will, we will do, we will bring people. And again, I want people who have, who are at the beginning of their study, the end of their study. I want different voices. I'd love, I'd love to get a German historian on to talk about it as well. And, and that aspect of how Germany perceives it and how Germany, the historiography of understanding what their nation did in the past. There's lots of things we can do, but, but that'll be September. So don't worry about it yet, folks. But anyway, right now, thank you very much for watching. Um, Check out the links below and definitely, as I say, follow Alina on Twitter and History Hack. And that you, 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 you've tackled a lot of Polish history via History Hack. So if you're if you've if exhausted all the World War II TV back catalog, go and check out the History Hack back catalog because there's what 350 shows now, is it? 
450. 450. I was 100 out in just over a year and a quarter. Is that right? You're and a- and you're on it too. So go and check out Woody on our podcast because he is fantastic, and we will be I've, getting him back. I've only done two. I've done two. I, I hosted one, and then you then um and then Alex asked me about my book. That's, I've only done two. I think. Oh, and I did a couple of down the pubs, didn't I? Yeah, but also I don't want to say too much because everything will be all revealed on Friday. But there is something new happening in my life, and I will be getting Woody on to work with me with this new project that's working on in my life. So yeah. watch Twitter because it will be revealed on Friday. There's, there's, it's, it's to do with Poland and history, isn't it? But we'll, we'll, we'll announce that anyway. Thank you very much for watching, folks. I will see you all again in an hour and a half's time to talk about hedgerow fighting in Normandy. So a different subject, but equally informative, equally passionate presenter. But right now, thank you very everybody for watching, and thank you, Alina, for joining me. Thanks, everybody. Thank Bye. You.